What's going on, gang? Last talk of the day. How are we doing? Keeping awake? Keeping with? It? Yeah! All right. As Chris mentioned, my name is Kevin Novak. I'm one of the senior data scientists at Uber. I want to talk with you a little bit about Uber, a little bit about data science, and essentially what data is like at the very far end of the entrepreneurial spectrum. First of all, by a show of hands, who here has not heard of Uber before? Awesome. My marketing team is doing a good job. This is great. So for those of you who haven't heard and for those of you who need a sort of broad strokes refresher, Uber is essentially an on-demand transportation platform. What that means is we go into a given city, find livery services, limo services, taxi services, anybody who does transportation well in a given marketplace and provide a technology platform for them to run their business on. On the flip side, we provide a smartphone app that you can download and essentially push a button and get a ride at five minutes or less. Essentially, we're the next version, the next iteration of transportation. Uh, Travis Kalanick, our founder, likes to talk about Uber as a cross between lifestyle and logistics. In the transportation world, lifestyle is give me what I want, give me exactly what it is. It's date night, I need a limo. I'm going out to the next TEDx event and I need a ride for me and six friends. Uh, it's Saturday morning and I just need to get to the laundromat. Whatever you need, we give you exactly what you want. And the logistics being, give it to me right now, whenever and wherever I need it. So that's the company at Broad Strokes. Essentially, now what I want to do is dig in a little bit more on what does it mean to do data science at Uber. Uh, as you can imagine, when it comes to reliable transportation, much like giving a TEDx talk, timing is everything. Uh, and essentially what that means is uh, we've developed a predictive model that essentially says given a pickup location and a drop-off location and a time of day, predict how long it would take a given driver to come pick you up or how long it would take that driver to cover this distance. For example, from right here, uh, at the Wake Chapel in Wake Forest to uh, the Greensboro Airport on Saturday at about 3 p.m. It would take you on the order of 29 to 31 minutes. Now what you're looking at here is a heat map of pickup times for San Francisco. Uh, the blue area being the less than two minute times we see downtown. Red area are the longer pickup times you start to see in the less populated further out suburbs of the city. Uh, those of you, especially in the front row, who are familiar with San Francisco, uh, get to see a really neat effect where most of the major streets and intersections in our city just magically appear off the map. And indeed, if you visualize it a little bit differently and take a step back, you can actually see the entire transportation network of San Francisco just visualized off of the Uber data set. Uh, this is one of the really inspiring pictures. This is like my, my personal beautiful mind moment. <laughs> ETAs, of course, are a massive part of, of what Uber does as far as data science goes, but by no means the only thing. Some of the other major initiatives that we work on and focus on are our dynamic pricing or our surge pricing algorithm. Essentially, what we could say is, uh, given a certain amount of supply that we've partnered with and given a certain amount of demand, what is the right price for cars at any one given point in time? And essentially, we've developed a system to dynamically change prices as the economic conditions dictate, um, and as well as a method to let customers know and sort of bake that into an entire product. Um, other things are map matching algorithm. If you open up the app, you'll see cars following the roads. That's not magic, that's data science. Essentially, we're mapping uh, lat long points from a given GPS to a road segment. Uh, other focuses include much more traditional predictions, uh, much like we do prediction of time of travel, uh, given a drop-off location and a pickup location, what's the expected fare? How much am I going to have to pay, right? This is the key part of any sort of transportation initiative, another one of our products. So, sorry. So that's the, uh, the big picture, where we're at as a company. Uh, founded relatively young, we're about, we were formed in about the middle of 2010, so we've been around about three and a half years. Uh, and really, what I was thinking about as I was preparing this talk is all of those products I was listing, all of those problems that we're trying to tackle are indeed very difficult, but they're difficult for reasons which most people don't think of when they think of data science. Uh, there's been several incredible data science talks given, some at TEDx events, some otherwise. I encourage you to look them up if you're more intrigued about the concept of data science as a field. 
Uh, but really what comes out of that, the commonalities that you figure out, is that data science is hard because it's a massive amount of information. We're just dealing with so much information, your computer's going to grind to a halt. Trying to figure out some sort of cohesive story that you could understand in 10 seconds or less is functionally impossible. Now that is indeed a huge part of what the complexity of data science is. But at Uber, where our complexity comes from, the, the problems that are difficult have to do with the fact that we're in a problem space that didn't exist five years ago. We don't have 20, 30 years of information to rely on, and indeed, nobody's really been trying to tackle these problems uh, in the rigorous quantitative way which we need to, to run our business. Uh, and so what I was thinking about is that <laughs> as what comes out of this is that even though the problem space is very similar to sort of the canonical definition of data science, uh, you know, distilling quantitative answers uh, for very ambiguous, complex problems, uh, especially at an early stage startup, the skill set is actually fundamentally different. And I, what I was thinking about as I was prepping this talk is calling myself a data scientist is a bit ambiguous and a bit disingenuous. Um, so borrowing from the standard startup lexicon, I wanted to discuss the concept of the data hacker with you guys. And essentially what this is, is how do we bring somebody who focuses on solving data-related problems in a space which was not, didn't exist, you know, as I was saying, is either very recently formed or in a company uh, that, that's only been in existence three, six, 12 months at a time. So, as with any good talk, I wanted to go and give you a few habits, a few best practices, some of the the, the tools and methods and habits that I think make us successful at this brand new field of data hacking. And I think some of the best ways to teach any given point is teach through example. And in this case, I'm going to show you an example of a way that we did not do data hacking well. Um, he, this is a study of our dynamic pricing algorithm, some of the early efforts um, designed by yours truly, so I get to pick on myself for a little bit. Uh, this here, what you're looking at here when, you, when I was talking about dynamic pricing, this is one of the very first iterations of our surge pricing screen that you would see in an app designed by yours truly. My favorite is the left aligned icon at the bottom. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a data scientist or a data hacker, not a visual designer. <laughs> One of the great things about this, this, app, this app, besides the fact that it exists, was that it was clearly designed for an engineer in mind, in that the most key piece of information when it comes to dynamic pricing, i.e. the price, is buried in size 12 font in a wall of text. All the engineers in the audience are like, yes, this is absolutely my bread and butter. So where you ship this, ran it through across our engineering team, everybody, woohoo! We, you know, we are moving the company forward, and we ran an experiment. Uh, this was uh, three months of data. Now what you're looking at is prices increasing along the x-axis, and the conversion rate increasing along the y-axis. And you're seeing a very peculiar economic phenomenon. As I increase my prices, more people want my product. I call this the Patron effect. <laughs> Now, what's really going on here is there's a hidden variable I'm not showing you guys. Uh, and, and what that is, is economic scarcity. So the way the model is working is it's only raising prices if there are very few Ubers available. If there are very few Ubers available, I guarantee your other alternatives are not existent. There are no taxis, there's no public transportation. It's 3 a.m. and your best friend is not coming to get you no matter how much you beg, plead, cajole, text him. And so what's happening is, is you have two competing factors that go into anybody making an economic decision. First of all is, how much does it cost? And second of all is, what else are my alternatives? Uh, and, and what you're really seeing here is somebody who's not paying attention to pricing. This is a strong signal to us as the developers, us as data hackers, uh, that we are not communicating key information well. So what I did in a flash of insight after seeing this, after putting the cigars away and sort of celebrating my financial future, uh, was hire the visual designer. I didn't touch a single line of code, and we redesigned the search screen to look something very similar to this. A stupidly large multiplier in the middle, in a different color, and didn't touch a single line of the model. And we just said, all right, I want to see what will happen. And what you see is a fundamentally different change in user behavior. Now. This is nice in that it 
let's, first of all, it's economically predictive, so now I can actually use pricing as a way to throttle uh, demand and sort of increase supply. The world is rational again. Adam Smith was right after all. <laughs> but the key moral here is that a data hacker builds a product, not just a model. An incredibly well-written model that's making all the right recommendations wrapped in a terrible product is indeed a terrible model. The second habit, and this is more about an outlook, conform your science to the startup and not the opposite. One of the key buzzwords that people like to throw around is my startup is data-driven. Data makes all the decisions, we're, we're in charge. And that's great for the ego, right? Like, yes, I am the man. Like, everybody else has to listen to me. Um, but the reality is, is that a startup, whether you use the metaphor of, of a fighter jet or a ship or whatever, you know, your convenient buzzword is, uh, is that data science is only going to be making the decisions if data science is moving at a speed uh, that can make the decisions. I like to describe a startup as a school of fish, where the, fish the school obviously has a very directed motion to it, um, but the decisions are all being made by the fish that happens to swim the fastest and is at the front of the pack. If you want to be a data team that steers your company, that wants to drive the data progress, you need to be swimming at the front of the pack. Data habit number three, and this is about people who want to come into data science. You've read the Forbes articles, you've seen the TEDx talks, you're inspired by what I'm telling you. I want to be a data hacker. Well, I would say to you, be a boat builder and not a sailor. And what that means is you need to cultivate a problem-solving mindset instead of a process-oriented mindset. If you come in and say, I want to use the latest MCMC algorithm, I, want to, I know 16 programming languages, I want to use the ball and say, that's awesome, I don't have a job for you. What I have a job for is somebody who can solve ambiguous, hard to understand, complex data problems, because that's frankly what the work is. Uh, this is what I'm talking about when I say the programming question. People say, what is, how much programming do I need to know? And my, my smart answer is, as much as gets the job done. Because really, that's what's going to make you successful as a data professional. And finally, data hacker habit number four. And this is where we get a little bit into the philosophy, the role of the data scientist, the role of the data hacker at any one given point in time in a company. Um, what your job is as the person who's distilling complex information into simple answers. You have an ethical obligation, a philosophical obligation to not only give the best answer you have, but to also make sure that you communicate your clarity, your confidence, your sincerity in your answer to the person who's consuming your information. And what I tell my people is always quote the error bars. Sometimes that's yourself. I'm a data person. I do financial modeling. I'm in a startup. Of course, I want to see things go up and to the right in 20 x right? That's a very natural perception bias that sometimes you don't even realize you're making. Uh, and so one of the good habits that you're always cultivating is, first of all, uh, have a good friend, have a good coworker, have a pair partner so that you're always bouncing information off each other, gut checking it, but also try and re remain skeptical of the work here. This is just sort of a good, healthy attitude to have in any form of science, data hacking or otherwise. But when you're talking about quoting an answer to a company, to your CEO, to your CFO, in startups, this is not about getting a promotion, and this isn't about advancing the company, and this isn't about getting a big bonus at the end of the day. Startups are the business form of Darwinism, survival of the fittest. We make decisions, and businesses are making decisions on data questions, on data answers you're giving, which may or may not put them out of business. And it's your obligation to them to communicate situations where you think data is very good or your solutions are very good or vice versa where your solutions are very bad because frankly your job depends on it and it's not a promotion it's the company goes out of business if you give the wrong answer so i want to talk a little bit about what's next for data science data hacking Uber in general. This is actually a, a promotion we did. Um, I wish I had DeLoreans every day, by far and away the most, the most successful promotion we ever ran with the nerdy crowd. But uh, <laughs> data science is an incredibly ambiguous field. As I was mentioning, uh, ask 15 different people, you'll get 15 different opinions about uh, what a data science person is. I only have three and a half minutes left. There's no way I'm going to try and take a stab at nailing this thing down. Uh, 
Speaking historically, you could argue that phone companies in the 70s and 80s were doing what is called data science. Uh, modern banking was revolutionized in the 90s by something very similar to data science. But really, where we're at right now is with the advent of cloud computing, with the, advent, the uh, advances we're making in uh, processor design and computing horsepower, you have a huge amount of relatively affordable computational horsepower made available to a segment of the technology using population in a way that just didn't exist three, four, or five years ago. And I think what's happening is sort of the modern consciousness is all, all of a sudden starting to figure out, oh man, these are all the cool things I can do with it, right? That's, that's kind of what's come rise to the modern data science uh, mythology. And so what I think, and what I'm predicting is going to happen as this field matures, coalesces a little bit more, is you're gonna have specializations develop. The concept just like, you know, if you think 200 years ago, every scientist was a philosopher, right? That's where the PhD comes from. Um, and we specialized, and then there were sciences, and there were physicists, and then there were nuclear physicists, and cosmic physicists, etc. Data science is gonna follow the exact same suit. Uh, but what I think is going to be really cool about that is whether, whether the job is called data hacking, I hope it is, because then I get to be that guy who is like, yeah, I'm 10 years ahead of everybody else. Uh, but <laughs> but whether, whatever it's called, this intersection of entrepreneurship and data is going to be huge, is huge, and will continue to be there. Uh, as with any wave, in business or otherwise, people who are out there who are daring to take it out, wrestle it to the ground, start the next company, build the next thing, are gonna be right on the bleeding edge of it. And being the person who does data science and brings that skill set to entrepreneurship means you're gonna be literally on the bleeding edge of the bleeding edge. If this interests you, if, it, if you're getting this pumped as I am, I invite you all. Let's get to hacking, everybody. Thank you very much.